All right, it is 12 o'clock on my clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. I want to welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us at uh, Medical Grand Rounds at the University of Colorado. It's my pleasure today to welcome Dr. Frank Scott. Uh, before we get started, just a couple of announcements. I think the first uh, and the biggest one is, is you know, an awareness of, of what's going on with COVID right now. Dr. Chopra has sent out a number of emails. There'll be town halls in the upcoming weeks. I think those are important to attend. Uh, the Omicron variant, for those who have seen numbers this morning, uh, is leading to a local test positivity rate that has now exceeded 30%. Um, so this is certainly widely spreading in our community. So please uh, take care of yourself and those you love, as well as our patients. Uh, the other thing I wanted to announce is that uh, CME credit is offered for all medical grand rounds this year, as it has been for uh, the last year and a half. And so please use the link that Kelly is placing in the chat to get your CME as well as MOC credits. Uh, and then finally, we'll use our Q&A function for all questions for Dr. Scott today. The chief residents and myself will gather those questions. We'll ask them at the end of the talk, but please put them in throughout the uh, talk and I'll make sure to collate those as we go on. Uh, and now I wanna introduce Dr. Frank Scott. He is an assistant professor of medicine here in the division of gastroenterology and hepatology at the University of Colorado. He was a medical student in Philadelphia at Temple University, did his internship and residency at uh, Weill Cornell in New York, and then was a GI fellow as well as an epi uh, master's student at the University of Pennsylvania. And we were lucky enough in 2016 to recruit him to the University of Colorado. Um, he has received a number of awards, uh, both local and national. Uh, he was noted as the Extraordinary Volunteer Award from the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation in 2018, the same year he won Teacher of the Year Award for the GI Fellowship here at the University of Colorado. Uh, he's been part of the Clinical Faculty Scholars Program here at the University of Colorado, as well as an outstanding uh, early career scholar. Nationally, he held many, many leadership roles within the GI community and specifically within the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, uh, where he sits on their publications committee. He's a member of the uh, American Gastroenterology Association Clinical Guidelines Committee uh, in the management of Crohn's disease and inflammatory bowel disease. Um, he is the director of the fellowship research program here for the GI fellowship. He's also the co-director of the GI outcomes research group and the co-director of the GI clinical core uh, known as DART, both positions he's held for a number of years. It really is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Frank Scott. Thank you, Dr. Connors, and, and thank you to Dr. Chopra as well for the invitation to speak to uh, at Grand Rounds today on the impact of delays in the diagnosis and treatment of inflammatory bowel disease. These are my disclosures. Uh, we'll start with a quick uh, clinical case. Um, we have a 22-year-old female who presents with two years of intermittent right-sided abdominal pain. She says it varies between crampy in nature to sharp uh, and is associated with intermittent loose stools and increased frequency to five to six bowel movements per day that tend to occur around her pain episodes as well. She also notes some a nausea, uh, which occurs at the time of her pain and reports significant fatigue, which is pretty much constant, as well as a five pound weight loss over the past six months. She also reports bilateral knee and wrist pain without swelling. She's seen her community provider three times over the past 12 months for these complaints and has had a, a baseline workup that's included a normal CBC, a normal TSH, a normal CMP, and a normal C-reactive protein. And was started on a trial of hyosamine by her PCP without significant symptomatic improvement. She was then referred to her a local gastroenterologist who ordered a fecal calprotectin, which was 467. And then she underwent a colonoscopy it demonstrated a normal colon, but in her terminal ileum, just proximal to the IC valve, there were deep serpiginous ulcers, focal luminal narrowing, and what appears to be an early stricture. Uh, biopsies demonstrated a chronic inflammatory picture consistent with ileal Crohn's disease. So I presented that case initially just to highlight some of the struggles that some of our patients have uh, during their initial period of becoming symptomatic in, with, uh, when dealing with and trying to manage inflammatory bowel disease. As we'll see, as we go through these slides, there are a number of, of periods throughout their disease course where they may develop potential delays that can negatively impact their overall outcomes or increase their risk of adverse events or healthcare utilization. Uh, the incidence of Crohn's in UC is increasing worldwide. This continues as demonstrated by this excellent systematic review uh, that collated data from over 230 countries. But if we look here in the US, the incidence may actually be plateauing over the last uh, 20 years or so. These are data from Olmsted County, uh, looking at both the incidence of Crohn's on the left and ulcerative colitis on the right. And you can see that we are sort of settling out at this uh, rate of about nine per 100,000 person years. 
years. While that incidence rate is stabilizing, um, the prevalence of Crohn's in UC will continue to compound over time. The impact of this was recently demonstrated in a recent simulation model that used data from 1990 to 2015 from several provinces in Canada and demonstrated a near doubling in overall prevalence of IBD from 2018 to pro projecting out to 2030. So our IBD patient population will continue to, to increase over time. Despite the well-described in increasing prevalence, the presentation of patients with IBD and in particular Crohn's can be quite heterogeneous, which potentially contributes to the delay in diagnosis. These are data from a survey uh, from patients uh, in the Oscar cohort, which is out of Brown in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, and they demonstrate that the most common symptoms uh, of patients presenting with a new diagnosis of Crohn's disease were fatigue and abdominal pain, not the sort of bloody diarrhea that we often will equate uh, to being consistent with a diagnosis of IBD. And in fact, uh, one third of patients did not even report diarrhea. A small percentage of patients may also pre initially present primarily with extraintestinal manifestations of their disease without uh, GI symptoms, and these can include u uveitis or iritis, skin manifestations such as erythema nodosum, arthropathies or arthritis, or even thromboembolic events or adverse impact on their bone health. And I personally have made the diagnosis of, of colitis in patients who have presented in particular with isolated ocular manifestations as their initial symptom. When one considers the timeline of disease in IBD, individuals typically have a long period prior to the development. We will call this the pre-symptomatic, pre-diagnostic phase. They then will become symptomatic uh, and may go several months, as we'll see, before actually obtaining a diagnosis, which then allows for the appropriate triage uh, and uh, treatment of their inflammatory bowel disease. Several studies have examined these delays in diagnosis and their impact, and I'll review a few now. This was a study by Schopfer and colleagues of 900 Swiss Crohn's disease patients from 2006 to 2011, so not that far in the, in the past here. They issued a questionnaire to, to each of these patients, and granted, you have to consider the potential for recall bias here, uh, but uh, half of the patients reported that it took at least 10 months for them to receive their diagnosis from their symptom onset, and in the uppermost quartile, these patients were symptomatic for more than two years before receiving a diagnosis of Crohn's disease. While disease location and age and gender did not appear to be associated with these differences, they did have a, a negative impact on their overall clinical course with a twofold increased risk of stenosis or intestinal surgery uh, in, in those that had the highest quartile or the, that greater than two years to diagnosis cohort. This delay in diagnosis has been confirmed in other research as well. This is a survey study by, led by Subrata Ghosh and colleagues in Europe uh, through the European Federation of Crohn's and, and UC associations. The survey was sent out to over 5,000 patients with both Crohn's and UC, and this just highlights the Crohn's data here, where you can see that uh, one-fifth of patients uh, noted symptoms for more than five years before receiving their diagnosis and that this negatively impacted their quality of life. Further data that shows that these delays potentially impact outcomes come from France in this cohort of 500 patients, where the median time to diagnosis is five months. And if you compared those that waited to the upper quartile or greater than one year for diagnosis, there was a significant increase in surgical rates in comparison to the rest of the cohort. So going back to our schematic that we had discussed earlier uh, related to the timeline of development of IBD related symptoms and diagnosis and treatment, you can envision several potential points for, the, for interventions that could potentially improve care. First would be the development of biomarkers, genetic screens uh, that identify individuals that are at high risk of becoming diagnosed with IBD even before they become symptomatic. And unfortunately, this is not one of the areas where there are a lot of promising um, factors that are currently available, um, but we'll touch on one cohort that's starting to unravel this picture. Um, secondly, once individuals become symptomatic, identifying uh, potential clinical and laboratory data that could allow for the rapid and expedited referral to GI and evaluation to either confirm or rule out the diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease. And then lastly, once diagnosed, appropriate risk stratification and initiation of steroid sparing therapy is really critical for improving care and reducing adverse events related to their IBD course, as we'll discuss in a few slides. <laughs> 
So going back to our uh, comment on the biomarkers and genetic screens, um, as of now, we currently do not have commercially available genetic or biomarker screens for individuals who may be considered high risk. And we generally know that individuals that have a first degree family member, for example, are at an increased risk of developing future IBD. We unfortunately do not know which first degree relatives would be at risk. Um, the PREDICTS cohort, which is a multi-center study that's being driven by the Department of Defense and Mount Sinai is attempting to sort of get to the, to the root of that. They have a really interesting biosample repository of 500 individuals who were diagnosed with Crohn's and 500 who were diagnosed with UC, as well as a large population of matched controls. And they, um, these individuals were in the military and prior to their diagnosis as part of their military enrollment, they had, they had serum banking uh, at an annual basis uh, over time, um, going back to a median time of, of five years, <laughs> which allows researchers to go back to those that have the, now have the diagnosis of IBD and look and see if there are any markers in their serum sample that may help us understand or, or predict their, their future risk. Using this unique cohort, researchers began exploring prognostic markers, including antibodies, which we've been studying for the last two decades now, particularly against various uh, compounds or proteins that are present on the surface of bacteria that live in the gut. This includes anti-Saccharomyces cerevisiae or anti-flagellin antibodies, um, but also now includes the addition of, of a fairly large SNP array of um, 51 different SNPs uh, that they assessed related to either metalloprotein or, or various markers of immune dysregulation that have been shown to be associated with IBD and other GWAS studies. What they found was um, that uh, while antibodies alone do seem to have a relatively good predictive capability about identifying future IBD, particularly as you get closer to the diagnosis in that year before a diagnosis, the addition of these somologic SNP markers does significantly augment this, where within one year in particular, you're now dealing with an area under the curve of 0 0.87 or 0 0.85 um, for the SNP markers plus antibodies, which is pretty impressive. And while this isn't, this requires validation in future cohorts prospectively, this does sort of highlight that we may be at the cusp of having a, a tool like this it, to uh, screen individuals that are particularly high risk, perhaps periodically or serially. Um, and we, may, we will definitely be seeing more out of this, uh, this research group in the, in the coming months to years. Moving on to the clinical factor, which is sort of more into my, into my domain now, when uh, how can we better integrate clinical factors and laboratory data get patients to their gastroenterologist in a, a more rapid fashion to either rule out or rule in the diagnosis. There's been a number of different European course consortiums to date that have, have tried to assess various clinical factors, and I'll re review a few and then one U.S. initiative here as well. The first of these was uh, published back, uh, I guess, about six years now uh, ago uh, called the Red Flags Index. Um, this was developed by the International Organization of IBD, which is a, a fairly large uh, body of uh, researchers uh, and clinicians in IBD. They conducted a systematic review of signs and symptoms strongly predicting Crohn's and uh, included 13 studies in their review and then convened 12 IBD experts to review these findings and compiled a final 21 item questionnaire slash uh, potential symptoms or signs or, or, or history that may predict a future diagnosis. Um, these initial 21 items are things that many of us would expect, uh, particularly for those of us that take care of uh, patients with IBD on a regular basis, such as complex or chronic perianal disease, uh, chronic diarrhea, nocturnal symptoms, rectal bleeding, uh, family history of having IBD, uh, tobacco use, uh, which is um, a fairly significant risk factor for a worse outcome, and a history of other autoimmune diseases. They then used a regression modeling to identify which of those factors most strongly predict the diagnosis of Crohn's using a, a baseline cohort of 203 patients stratified by either having Crohn's or irritable bowel syndrome or being healthy controls in three European cities. And I attempted to identify which of those individual 21 factors were most strongly predictive of being in the Crohn's cohort, uh, the perianal disease and family history, and then uh, more systemic signs of illness were strongly associated uh, with being in that cohort. And then they uh, identified a potential cutoff 
using the coefficients from this regression model, wherein you could potentially predict who is going to be Crohn's or not Crohn's. Um, and they identified a cutoff using this scoring system greater than or equal to eight um, to be strongly predictive. Um, in fact, you look at these uh, sensitivities and specificities and odds ratios and you're, and you're kind of like, all right, well, uh, we, clearly we need to wait for the validation of this because these numbers are a little magical. Um, and so they did subsequently validate this and this was published last year. And it was unfortunately not as convincing. The sensitivity and specificity for the RFI, which are the dark bars here, um, uh, took a significant hit uh, in comparison to the 0 0.94 that we saw in their original derivation cohort. Um, but there are some highlights here that are of potential use. First off, um, test characteristics test characteristics, particularly related to negative predictive value, were very strong. Um, and every, all of the test characteristics, including sensitivity and specificity and PPV, in, improved significantly if you added fecal calprotectin, which there's a growing body of evidence to suggest could be a useful uh, interventional or, I mean, sort of diagnostic tool that could be used from either in the point of care setting or sending patients off to a lab that have chronic GI symptoms to rule out IBD. So, I think the clinical characteristics alone here are promising, but you add the fecal calprotectin in and it uh, is potentially promising work for identifying patients sooner. Another similar effort uh, was, uh, sorry, one slide too far, was IBD Refer, uh, which was recently published uh, in uh, out of an Israeli cohort. Um, they took a slightly different strategy where they didn't use regression modeling, but identified both major criteria and secondary criteria, again, using a systematic review um, and modified Delphi criteria to rank the potential risk factors that they got from the review amongst a panel of uh, 10 expert um, IBD experts. And they identified, uh, you know, again, some symptoms that we would normally expect to be associated, but importantly, they also included laboratory parameters in their base model, including that fecal calprotectin, which we alluded to, uh, uh, less specific markers such as CRP or ESR, um, or even uh, positive ASCA and ANCA, uh, which we don't routinely test here in the United States. Um, the sensitivity and specificity on the left here in the um, for the IBD refer did appear to exceed that for red flags index, um, and so it'll, you know they are in the uh, process of further validating this work. But these are are really promising again when you start to see numbers this high. You, you do want to see some external cohort validation. So collaborating with David Rubin at the University of Chicago, as well as the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation nationally, we've recently begun using these criteria to, um, and these methods to develop a similar care referral pathway for here in the United States. Again, given the, the test characteristics of the IBD refer group, we used a similar sort of major and minor criteria. And the goal of this pathway would be to identify risk factors that would not only allow for the expeditious referral of individuals to a gastroenterologist for whom you may think has IBD, but also to allow you, uh, individuals who have IBD who may have al alarm symptoms that they need uh, escalated care to uh, prompt referral to an IBD specialist center. And so this is unpublished data right now, but you can see some of the same factors that we've talked about before. Uh, these are all sort of uh, ranked through modified UCLA RAND methods. Um, and uh, we will be sort of published, submitting this for publication in the next probably four to six weeks. And then the next step will be uh, a planned validation within uh, US populations and then potential dissemination and implementation trials depending on those results. Shifting gears, once a diagnosis of IBD is made, there are emerging literature that suggests that appropriate disease-related stratification in tr treatment is, is really critical. And that gets us to this last potential point for intervention here. As you are certainly aware, there are multiple therapies that are currently available to treat IBD. Um, and I actually like to jump, joke with the appropriate patient who I think will get this, uh, that it's an exciting time to have inflammatory bowel disease because when I was a just starting my medicine residency and starting to get interested in IBD. We had corticosteroids and we had azathioprine. And at that point we had infliximab. Um, 
Uh, and now we have infliximab, adalimumab, sertolizumab, golimumab in the anti-TNF realm. We have anti-leukocyte adhesion uh, inhibitors in the terms of vetalizumab and natalizumab in the appropriately screened patient population. We have our first anti-IL-1223 and ustekinumab, and we're about to have a whole cluster of IL-1223 specific biologic therapies that may have even better uh, performance characteristics than ustekinumab with regards to remission and response in the same safety profile. And now we have also have the advent of new oral therapies that we have not advanced from azathioprine or methotrexate, which have been around for decades at this point, um, in the form of tofacitinib and not shown here, but uh, is ozanamod, which affects leukocyte trafficking uh, through lymphoid tissues. In addition, we're accumulating a growing body of evidence that suggests that these available therapies not only acutely help our patients feel better and reduce their steroid exposure, but also potentially change or bend the arc of their disease course. Uh, this is a really fascinating observational study by Rungo and colleagues that was published about eight years ago now. Um, they divided a cohort of 13,000 patients with Crohn's up into four cohorts based on time uh, from diagnosis. Um, and their four cohorts were uh, 1979 to 86, 87 to 94, 95 to 2002, and then the most recent one, 2003 to 2011. Keep in mind that infliximab was FDA approved in the United States around 1997 for Crohn's disease. And you can see that prior to 19, their, their cohorts prior to 1994, here in one and two, demonstrated an approximate surgical risk of around 50% um, within 20, uh, 20 years of diagnosis. Um, but in the sort of straddling anti-TNF era that decreased to just above 20% and improved even further if you look at individuals who were diagnosed in the anti-TNF era. Furthermore, uh, we know that delays in stepping up to these biologic therapies appear to have deleterious consequences for our patient and potentially increase the risk of surgery. This is a retrospective cohort study from Spain, where they had 467 individuals who were starting immunosuppressive therapy and looked at whether or not they required a major IBD-related abdominal surgery over their disease course and how long they waited to start steroid-sparing biologic therapies, in this case, uh, anti-TNFs. In the cohort uh, that ended up having surgery, their time from diagnosis to receiving uh, an anti-TNF was 120 months. In the cohort that did not require surgery, it was much shorter at 30 months, suggesting that there's a strong association between reduction in surgical risk and the use of uh, appropriate steroid sparing therapies. Similar findings have been appreciated in a large pediatric cohort as well where patients starting steroids, steroid sparing therapies within 90 days of diagnosis here defined as early TNF exposure versus later than 90, degree, 90 days or uh, not early TNF um, had significantly lower rates of penetrating complications. And you can see here, if you stratify in panel B, your cohort by early versus non-early um, TNF exposure, the red lines, that there's a significant reduction here in the hazard of requiring a surgery related to disease or having a penetrating complication. And that has a, there was a 70% reduction in those events, um, which is really impressive. So one could consider this sort of overly simplified schematic um, when presented with a new patient such as ours that we just reviewed who presents with like new diagnosis of Crohn's, she's had disease for, you know, or symptoms at least for, per her report, two years. Um, one could consider just giving her corticosteroids, which are still, a, you know, a significant backbone for our therapeutic regimen. Uh, they are highly effective, uh, particularly during the first course, uh, with remission rates that approximate 80%, and then just repeating those steroids as needed. Alternatively, um, you could initiate initial steroids if needed, uh, and then consider moving the patient with appropriate uh, risk factors uh, with our patient. This would be her deep ulceration, her age at diagnosis, and the early evidence of stenosis to steroid sparing therapy. And where we have on the right side here, the, all of the potential options that we've discussed. And, and while I won't get into sort of medication positioning um, in, in this talk, I would highlight that trying to figure out the best uh, 
algorithm or sequence of therapies to, in which to treat our patients is also an active area of research and one that I'm sort of heavily involved in. Uh, there's a lot of back and forth in the literature right now as we don't have robust head-to-head -head clinical trials, like for instance, our oncologic co colleagues have, um, but those are, some of those are underway. Unfortunately, selecting the second path, the first pathway that I highlighted, the, the lower one with regards to corticosteroid use and then repeating corticosteroids as needed is not that uncommon. Uh, this is a retrospective cohort of veterans with inflammatory bowel disease uh, derived from uh, uh, the Michigan or Ann Arbor cohort uh, by my colleague Akbar, Akbar Walji up at Michigan. Um, they looked at individuals who had a GI visit and who did not and had continued steroid use or intermittent corticosteroid use, meaning several courses over the same year. Both of these groups would technically be, it would be advised that you consider moving the steroid sparing therapy for them. Only 70% of those that saw a gastroenterologist actually got that escalation of their care that they needed. So again, another potential uh, uh, window for us to intervene and improve the care we provide for our patients uh, by moving more aggressively to these appropriate biologic therapies. Situation was even more dire in those that did not get referred to a GI at all, in which only two thirds of patients or, um, or in, uh, in which one third of patients, sorry, uh, was appropriately escalated. So again, a, a big window here for potential intervention. And these longitudinal steroid exposures do have risks associated with them. Again, in the same cohort of uh, 30,000 veterans, uh, uh, Walji and colleagues demonstrated that uh, repeated courses of corticosteroids were ex uh, associated with an increased risk of infection, as well as fracture. And I don't have a, another slide here, but also with venothromboembolic events as well. Uh, so we, not only when we identify patients and make the diagnosis for, for Crohn's or UC, it's really important to consider, are they requiring repeated courses of steroids? Do, do they have moderate to severe disease? Should we be thinking about escalating their care to biologic therapy sooner? Jim Lewis and I recently examined the impact of repeated corticosteroid use uh, in over 7,600 Medicare enrollees as well. Uh, we identified individuals within this cohort with a relatively new diagnosis of CD or UC, and then looked at uh, their first steroid prescription and allowed individuals to have received one script and then either uh, continue to receive corticosteroids continuously or in repeated courses or get transitioned to an anti-TNF, um, any of the commercially available ones, including infliximab, adalimumab, sertolizumab, and golimumab. And we treated anti-TNF exposure as a time-variant covariate in these models. We demonstrated that in those that were, uh, that had um, received an anti-TNF, there was actually a mortality benefit in this cohort uh, for our Crohn's patients, um, a reduction in mortality related to probably other complications related to steroid exposure. Um, we saw a similar point estimate with our ulcerative colitis cohort, but that cohort was uh, about one third the size of the, of the Crohn's cohort um, in this uh, sort of claims-based data. Um, and we suspect that based on the, it's just the sample sizes that, uh, that we did not reach significance there, but the point estimate was fairly similar. We also have some emerging data that delaying anti-TNFs may negatively impact quality of life for our patients as well. We took that same base cohort from Medicare from the previous slide, and I reconstructed their disease course via simulation modeling, emulating their transitions either through various anti-TNFs or through repeated corticosteroid exposures, and applied a quality of life metric to uh, determine whether or not delaying anti-TNFs resulted in delayed or re resulted in uh, reduced quality of life. In order to study the quality of life piece, which is a little bit different than sort of hard outcomes such as mortality or, or billable code events that you may see in um, discrete claims data, we chose to develop a novel metric, uh, which, we will, which we now refer to as the remission time equivalent. Um, the issue with most traditional quality adjusted life years uh, that are used in IBD related modeling are they're all derived from a single study um, that use time trade-off and standard gamble methods, which have their issues. Uh, they're anchored on perfect time. They're assumed to be constant over time. And they, uh, they, they, these were developed in the mid-90s in the pre-biologic era. 
Uh, Dr. Mina Butra, my colleague at Penn, uh, sent out a survey to over 800 Crohn's patients through IBD Partners, which is a part of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, and we're performing essentially what is a discrete choice experiment over about 30 different questions, asking them to rank different treatments uh, that remain nameless and assess different risks such as infection or need for surgery or how often you'd be symptomatic or how, much, how many steroids you'd require. <clears throat> This new metric, the RTE, uh, as you can see, is not linear over time um, and, and can have different values for different periods from an anchored time point. And it does not make the sort of perfect health assumption that qualities do as well. Uh, and also has a unique property that allows us to uh, develop, uh, perform latent class analyses. And, and patients actually did stratify fairly nicely into three different cohorts, those that had a preference towards efficacy, those that wanted to avoid steroids, and those that wanted to avoid risks uh, related to medical therapy. We then applied those back in that simulation model that I had constructed, and we demonstrated that overall anti-TNFs resulted in a higher mean remission time equivalent, which in, in this axis, uh, the greater the number, uh, the, the better quality of life. And this was true regardless of which class you were even, even those that wanted to avoid medication-related risks. Um, there was a significant improvement with anti-TNFs compared to corticosteroids. However, the examples so far in the VA and in Medicare and in our simulation model really focus on sort of longer term outcomes and risks of repeated corticosteroid exposure. Um, there's very little that's currently known about how acute delays, even when we've decided to initiate these medications may impact our patients. Most often we're initiating biologics or small molecules when patients are acutely ill, uh, significantly reduced quality of life, high risk for hospitalization, and are receiving corticosteroids, uh, which put them at increased risks and data that I haven't shown here. And even the short-term courses, that initial sort of eight-week burst starting at 40 milligrams and tapering by five milligrams per week to, to off of sepsis, thromboembolic event, and fracture. Um, These are some data that were presented by uh, Akbar and Walji and, and one of his mentees um, at, a, at a recent conference. So clearly there's a potential benefit here uh, to expedite that process if we can reduce steroid exposure, but we don't really understand exactly what the risks are um, in the entire process. And biologic or small amount molecule initiation, be it with an anti-TNF or anti-IL-1223, anti-adhesions, or, or as Anamod or Tofacinib takes time and it's complex and there are multiple steps, which I'll sort of walk through right here. Usually there's initially some form of patient contemplation and uh, provider uh, evaluation and discussion of the risks and benefits with the patient. Sometimes patients will say, you know, doc, whatever you want, uh, I think is appropriate. Other patients will want to go and review on the internet appropriately and discuss with their family members and it may take several days. Um, there's also always a laboratory evaluation phase in biologic therapy. The initial infliximab studies demonstrated an increased risk of hepatitis B reactivation as well as tuberculosis reactivation in particular. And so individuals require hep B panels and TB status evaluation, which I'll touch on in a few slides here. Of particular interest to me as well, as you'll see, uh, as we go further through the talk here, there's also an issue with regards to prior authorization with our payers. Um, this can be a quite a lengthy process and is not only a headache for us, but a headache for our support staff and our patients and may actually negatively impact care. And then once medications are approved, then they have to schedule an appointment with the infusion center. Uh, they have to or receive their injectable medication to go and actually receive the first dose. Collectively, this biologic initiation time can be really prolonged. And in perspective, data that I collected, uh, which we'll touch on a little bit later, but even before the research that I'm about to show you, the median time uh, exceeded 24 days from time from when the physician recommended a biologic to receiving the first dose. And keep in mind, again, this is three and a half weeks of patients on high-dose prednisone feeling un unwell, you know, at risk for hospitalization or urgent care utilization. I first became interested in this topic of sort of time in this in this sort of biologic onboarding process uh, when I was an instructor at Penn. Um, and during my GI and IBD fellowships there, we had, uh, you know, the transition had been made from screening PPDs to serologic testing 
uh, such as quantiferon gold, because you don't have to rely on a patient re returning to get their PPD read. Uh, it, it's a simple blood draw, et cetera, and it can yield one of three results, as I'm sure you're all fairly familiar with. Negative, which means it's safe to proceed with your anti-TNF. Positive, which means latent TB is, has likely been detected and therapy may be required or an ID consult may be considered or several weeks of antibiotic therapy before starting the, their, their biologic or the dreaded indeterminance, um, which is an unclear result, not, not possible to be in, interpreted. So we would often receive these indeterminate results when patients were particularly ill, either in the inpatient or the outpatient setting. And we noticed just anecdotally that they were sort of markedly delaying care while clinicians tried to figure out what we should do with them. And so I spent the next two years working with one of my mentees, Ravi Vadravalu, who's now uh, at, at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, extracting data from a cohort of patients uh, with IBD uh, who were undergoing quantiferon testing and identifying those with an indeterminate test and matching them two to one to those who had a negative test. We first sought to identify what predicted potential indeterminate results um, as we felt that this was contributing to delays in care and identified that being hospitalized resulted in a 3.8 uh, odds ratio of having an indeterminate result, as did systemic corticosteroid exposure at the time. Age, gender, IBD subtype, disease severity, other IBD meds were not significantly associated. What this highlights is the potential window for us to intervene in terms of when we think about how we should be doing tuberculosis testing for this patient population. Instead of waiting for them to be in the hospital for three days and failing IV steroids before sending that TB test, if we think that that's the course that they're headed on, we should be sending it on day one. And if you meet somebody with moderate disease in the outpatient setting and they're not on steroids, they're... Uh, uh, steroid therapy at the time, you should be assessing it right then as well. As I mentioned, we were also particularly interested in the potential impact of these indeterminate results. And we looked at anti-TNF initiation delays of greater than 30 or greater than 60 days and hospitalization within 60 days, as well as the need for surgery or whether or not, whether or not an ID consult was considered as well. Um, as we had extracted a wide array of clinical data for this cohort, uh, including disease severity, gender, IBD subtype, Montreal classification providers, and whether or not they were an IBD subspecialist that were involved in the care. And we also had a small number of outcomes for these, in particular, the hospitalization-related events. We employed a, a form of propensity score adjustment known as inverse probability of treatment weighting to adjust for all of these potential confounders and try to compare like individuals. And after doing that adjustment, we identified that um, having an indeterminate result adjusted for all these other baseline characteristics was associated with a 35% increased risk of a delay of greater than one month. 23% increased risk of a delay greater than 60 days, and perhaps most impactfully, uh, uh, an increased risk of hospitalization within the next two months of 12%. Uh, we suspect this is, a, again, related to the isolating the effect of having a delay related to the indeterminate result. But quantiferon testing represents just one piece of a complex chain of events that we all take for granted in initiating biologic therapies. And in particular, as I mentioned, I'm very interested in sort of this big headache in, in all of our lives and how it may impact care. But better understanding the entire process is also warranted as there are very limited data to describe this and, and, and what factors may contribute to prolonging the biologic initiation time and the downstream effects. And so in order to better understand this, uh, we developed the, the DECODE IBD study, which is currently funded by the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, um, to, which strives to describe the consequences of delays in biologic initiation in our patients with two aims. One, ac accurately measuring these time intervals and how long they should take and factors within each of them um, that may promote delays that may be modifiable. But then also following patients for up to six months up after the initiation to, to evaluate for cumulative steroid use and adverse events related to care, including hospitalization, urgent care use, and surgery. This has two phases, one which is just completed, uh, working with my uh, one of my mentees at Children's Colorado and Ed DeZone, uh, my men mentee Brad Constant, uh, who's now at Children's Hospital of, of Philadelphia and doing his IBD fellowship, really led the, uh, the, the charge on the retrospective piece of it in a pediatric cohort. And then there's a prospective adult cohort that's ongoing, uh, is a multi-center study, uh, and we're still accruing patients uh, for that study.
as the pediatric piece of it sort of has wrapped up, I'll sort of talk about that now and excited to announce that this has been accepted for publication in pediatrics. Uh, so we should be seeing this in press in the next couple of, uh, couple of weeks here. Um, it was a single center retrospective cohort study of patients from 2010 to 2020. Uh, the major outcomes of interest uh, for the first phase were, phase were the overall biologic initiation time and factors that may influence that biologic initiation time, identifying predictors, including each individual predict, uh, phase. And then um, for the second aim was a combined outcome of adverse events that included hospitalization, surgery, or ED use. And I know this says all three, but I can tell you about 85% of our events were actually in this pediatric population were hospitalizations. And then also measuring whether or not biologic initiation time was associated with an increased risk of corticosteroid dependence. For the first aim, uh, we used multivariable linear regression. And for the second aim, we used a propensity score adjusted analysis assessing the association between BIT and also starting to break down down some of the biologic, uh, some of the uh, processes related to prior authorization and their association between adverse events, healthcare utilization, and corticosteroid dependence. You can see here, with regards to factors associated with longer BIT or biologic initiation time, that each of the phases, uh, the contemplative phase, the laboratory phase, the scheduling phase, were associated with like one day increases in the overall biologic initiation time in our, in our multivariable adjusted model, which at the end of the day, if it only took four or five days for my patient to get their first dose of their, of their infliximab, I, I'd be super thrilled about. The real issue it became apparent after this aim was up here and with regards to the insurance phase. In particular, requiring a prior authorization prolonged biologic initiation by more than 10 days. And if that prior authorization process was complicated, which we defined as requiring a peer-to-peer -peer or a letter um, to attempt to, uh, to get approval for the medication or even requiring eventual step therapy, there was an additional 14.3 day increase in the time to biologic initiation. And in this, in this overall cohort of 190 pediatric patients, the median time to biologic initiation was about 25 days. Moving on to the impact of those prior authorization policies on adverse events over the next six months, we can see that in our propensity score models, uh, that there was a strong association between prior authorization requirements and subsequent delays, uh, or I mean, subsequent increased risk of adverse events. Again, most of these were hospitalization which, with an up to 13% increased risk. Um, interestingly, this did not appear to be influenced by insurance type, public versus private was how we stratified this variable. In fact, a private insurer seemed to have a slight protective effect here. Um, and our, we look for a sort of a dose response with regards to the complicated prior authorizations, but we had very small number of adverse events in those that were exposed here. And you can see that sort of uh, demonstrated in the very wide confidence intervals that we have here. So that will definitely require further research. With regards to corticosteroid dependence, it also appeared that prior authorization policies uh, were associated with a 14% increased risk of uh, of being remaining on corticosteroids at six months. Uh, and this was further augmented uh, by having a complicated prior authorization as well. So as I mentioned, that was the retrospective piece of this. The prospective study uh, is currently enrolling patients right now across six participating sites, including University of Colorado, uh, University of Pennsylvania, UNC, Mount Sinai, and then two uh, more uh, community-oriented clinics. Um, we're also in, in conversation with a few other clinics to try to expand this list right now. Uh, and our enrollment has taken a little bit of a, of a, a timeline hit uh, with regards to the impact of the COVID pandemic, but we do continue to enroll. At, thus far, we're at 169 patients who are approaching the cohort size of the pediatric retrospective study at this point. Fairly uh, broad list of biologics and small molecules that are, are being initiated. Again, um, as with the pediatric cohort and my preliminary data, we are still seeing this sort of 24 to 25 day medium biologic initiation time, which with some patients experiencing uh, times much longer than that. Um, but more to come. Uh, we are also conducting semi-structured interviews in a random sample of these patients. Uh, 35 have been conducted so far. Their mean time to drug initiation represent, was representative of the overall cohort. 80% or four-fifths wish they 
had started their medication more rapidly and 60% felt that the main factor driving their delay was related to their prior authorization process. This just sort of highlights for me that uh, when we think about sort of major interventions that we could make here to improve the quality of care that we provide for our patients, expedite the start of these medications, figuring out a way to uh, more rapidly receive these authorizations is, is a clear target, but it also a, a, a tough uh, nut to crack. So more to come. So in summary, uh, several studies have demonstrated that delays in diagnosis, particularly for Crohn's, are associated with poor outcomes. There are several studies underway to develop biomarkers to expedite diagnosis even before patients become symptomatic. Uh, however, clinical indices are, are very close to usability. Um, you should expect to see more out of that, especially here at CU in the, in the coming months to years. Um, once diagnosed, using biologic therapies earlier likely reduces mortality, improves quality of life, and reduces the risk of surgery or hospitalization related to IBD. And barriers to expedited biologic initiation persist. And these may have clinical consequences. And we should think about every step of the care that we provide and how we initiate these medications to perhaps expedite them and reduce steroid exposure and reduce the risk of adverse events related to care. So I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues in the GI Outcomes Research Group and at the University of Colorado Crohn's and Colitis Center at, and uh, back at the University of Pennsylvania, including my mentor, Jim Lewis, uh, my mentee, Brad Constant at, at Children's Colorado, now at CHOP, um, and my multi-site collaborators in DECODE, as well as my funding support from the DOM Outstanding Early Career Scholars Program and the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. Thanks for your time, and I uh, look forward to your questions. Dr. Scott, thank you. That was fantastic. Um, there's a lot of very interesting questions here. There's a lot of really good primary care questions. I think about, you know, getting these patients started, which is they, they start there before they see you. Yeah. Um, I said a question of my own before we get into that. Is there a steroid free future for these patients? Is there, is there going to be a time when we say there's something better than steroids as the first line therapy? I think there are some really interesting data already with regards to patients in whom you can get them rapid access to infliximab. Uh, that shows that you, you because infliximab is fairly rapid acting, that you may not need to even go through that initial steroid course. The challenge is always going to be, I can give you a script for prednisone right now. If it's going to take me three weeks to get you that first dose of infliximab, then I, I can't in good conscience send you off and say, you know, come back in three weeks and get your first med. So, um, you know, that's going to be a barrier. But I think the other exciting opportunities are our new oral therapies that don't, may not have the same prior authorization issues. Um, Tofacitinib or, or has a, a black box label that will only let us use it after another biologic right now, but Ozanamod doesn't have that. And so as we have an ex we're going to see continuing expanding oral options, I suspect some of them may feel that need. If we could avoid even that first course of prednisone as effective as it can be, it, it is associated with risks and I would love to do that. That's interesting. And there's a related question that came from someone just now, which is uh, the delays that you see in getting these medications, obviously it's, it's, it's an area of study and it's very interesting. Is, do we see the same delays in other non-GI conditions? Does the oncologic community have the same trouble getting these medications? Not necessarily the oncologic uh, community, um, but there are some compelling data in other disease processes such as diabetes and, and asthma, where uh, there, there are emerging data that delays, particularly related to the prior authorization policies, can induce harm and reduce compliance. Um, so I think collectively as a field, we're all starting to uh, accrue some of the data we're gonna need to sort of push back against these policies. When I first proposed the code, I got some comments from some people in the foundation, um, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, uh, that yeah, th this is an issue. We all know that it's there and there's not much we can do about it. And my response to that was we can't do anything about it until we quantify it and measure the harm. And then we have ammunition to go to the insurers and say, listen, not only are you uh, hurting our patients, but you're actually driving up your own costs if you look far enough to, downstream. That hospitalization that that patient didn't need to have is, is more expensive than that one dose of infliximab that they could have gotten. Yeah, absolutely. Um, question, you know, from some of the primary care docs, what, you know, one of them is, you know, diagnosis of abdominal pain and workup of abdominal pain. It's obviously very challenging. Um, and, and most of these patients will not have an inflammatory bowel disease. You mentioned in one of your slides that diarrhea greater than one month is reason for GI referral. Is that reasonable from your perspective in terms of how many of those patients are not going to you know, ultimately need your care as opposed to a, a workup for a chronic diarrhea? You know, I, I think that's an excellent window for where something like a fecal cow protecting can be really informative. 
you know, at studies that, that I didn't present here have shown that in individuals with chronic diarrhea, where you're really concerned that there may be overlapped irritable bowel syndrome, et cetera, that may be contributing or other causes that a negative fecal CalPRO or CalPRO less than 100 has a, a negative predictive value that is in the mid 90 percentile for uh, an inflammatory cause of their etiology. Um, so they, they may not, as you mentioned, have a diagnosis of IBD, but if we could identify ways to expedite the evaluation to ensure that it's not inflammatory or secretory or osmotic, I think our patient's quality of life will be better. And one of the other questions that came through, if you can just, just go back through sensitivity and specificity, was, was that's exactly what the next question was, was how sensitive and how specific is it in this population? Uh, the fecal calprotectin or, yeah, or the screen. The yeah, so it, it, it's fairly highly sensitive. I think we do take a little, you know, sensitivities for CalPros, of, depending on what cutoff you use of greater than 100 or greater than 150, uh, tend to, like I said, approximate the mid 90 percentile. So you're not going to miss a lot of IBD. The one po patient population that we do worry a little bit about is isolated ileal Crohn's disease, um, where their CalPros, because of the amount of surface area, that's involved for, for those that don't know, fecal calprotectin it resides in the alpha granules and neutrophils. And when there's inflammation in the lining of the colon, the neutrophils sort of move towards the surface there to, to, be, to participate, release these alpha granules. And that's the CalPro that we're detecting in the stool. Um, so it's kind of surface area dependent. It becomes much you know, more accurate for disease tracking when there's large amounts of colon involved, for example, but you'll have some patients that are uh, slightly subclinical levels in Crohn's. Um, but if you look at the overall sort of IBD population as a whole and ruling in, ruling out IBD, there have been several cohort studies now that have shown that you know, it, th that sensitivity is fairly high. If it, it's, it's not specific, there are other, inf any inflammation in the GI tract anywhere can cause a positive CalPro. Um, but it does prompt you to look further. It, it would prompt you to refer to GI, to consider colonoscopy, to consider enterography, additional imaging. One of the things that I've been talking with Mark Garrick a lot over the last uh, uh, couple of years uh, has been to develop a protocol that would allow us to sort of take some of that burden on individuals that have some of these high risk clinical features and, you know, wherein the, we would place the order set. Um, and, and that's something you may hear about more in the, in the future as we look for somebody to help sort of financially support that effort. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Always the challenge. Yeah. Um, can you talk about, there's a question about why rates are rising in the world, why they might be plateauing in the U.S. And, and I think the specific question is, what are the environmental factors? Why, why might this be the case? Yeah. I mean, that is an incredibly tough uh, and challenging question. That is the million dollar question right now. Um, you know, we, we think that their environment clearly plays a role and there's this sort of classic Venn diagram figure of genetic predisposition and environmental exposure and some modification of the microbiome, which we think are the sort of trifecta that get you from being uh, predisposed to developing Crohn's to actually becoming a Crohn's disease patient. Um, and there are some really fascinating research on dietary compositions, in particular related to uh, uh, preservatives that we may ha have incorporated into our diet over the last several decades that were, you know, emerging in the 50s and 60s, and now we're sort of chronically used, which would explain that sort of plateau effect and also explain how in other areas of the world, particularly as they become uh, more industrialized, that their dietary composition is changing and starting to mimic ours. There's also always been the sort of allergy or allergen exposure hypothesis that we, we sort of raise with regards to incidence rates of eczema and rheumatoid arthritis uh, and asthma, which are just are following very similar trend lines to IBD worldwide as well. Mm -hmm. No. And somebody, a, a perfect follow-up question to that is, is not only the things that kick this off, but maybe what can reduce it in terms of dietary modification. You know, there's been a lot out there about plant-based diets. Um, is this something you recommend for everybody because it, it some ways can't hurt or have you, what's your sense of the effectiveness? Yeah, you know, we're, we're just at the point now where we're starting to have some data on that. Um, and it, it, so Jim, uh, who I mentioned as my mentor, just recently wrapped up a multi-center clinical trial looking at Mediterranean diet versus something called the simple carbohydrate diet, uh, identified that both were capable of reducing CRP levels and uh, reducing steroid utilization over time. Um, and in our pediatric cohorts, we have uh, really promising data that show that enteral nutritional supplements or shakes and stuff uh, potentially could reduce uh, removing the sort of oral diet from the picture may potentially impact um, the disease course and be as effective as steroids in our pediatric patients. Um, in my clinical practice right now, while we still await for dietary 
data to accumulate uh, for patients with more sort of mild to moderate disease that are, are fairly motivated. Um, I am willing to try trials of the Mediterranean diet. It's usually a little bit better, uh, better to tolerate um, than the simple carbohydrate diet. Um, but often once they sort of hit that moderate th threshold as well, I, I carefully counsel them that they should also be considering medical therapy too. As you noted, like a, uh, switching to the Mediterranean diet isn't going to hurt their IBD. It probably will help their overall cardiovascular health and numerous other things. It's, you know, it's the, the fad du jour, uh, but um, it, 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 the harm that's potentially involved is, is minimal. Um, I think the simple carbohydrate diet's a little bit different. Uh, and the, another one that we will often try for symptom control is low FODMAPs. And there are some data that suggests that chronic use of those, if not in a, in a non-monitored fashion, working with a nutritionist, uh, can result in some micronutrient deficiencies over time. And so if, if, if somebody wants to try particularly low FODMAPs diet, I'll usually get our, our GI dietitian involved as well. And maybe this will just be me for the whole audience. Low FODMAPs diet, please. Yeah, so uh, there, there's this idea that there are certain uh, uh, sugars uh, such as fructose and uh, other oligosaccharides that uh, can be digested by the bacteria in your gut uh, faster than your own in, uh, enteral epithelium can absorb them. And the byproduct of, of that is gas, in, which can contribute to diarrhea uh, and to bloating. Gotcha. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. Um, can you talk about the uh, history of Campylobacter infection as a risk factor for IBD? Is that something that you see bear out? I, I think if you ask, uh, there have been some really interesting studies that have shown that about half of our patients, if you ask them, will point to an, an acute episode that occurred sometime before uh, their symptom onset. And this does get back to the uh, underlying sort of environmental versus microbiome uh, perturbation sort of uh, part of the three pieces that could result in a diagnosis of IBD. Um, we often don't identify what that actual infectious agent is and Campylobacter being one of the things that was easily identifiable sort of more early on sort of has carried that sort of torch. Um, we don't think that Campylobacter in and of itself can cause IBD, but it and other infections may in the predisposed individual sort of kick off the, that, um, that um, dysbiosis, uh, that change in the flora of the GI tract and result in eventual clinical symptoms. Stratifying who is going to be at risk from that sort of exposure versus who is not, uh, it, 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 we're way too in our, into our sort of infancy and understanding all of the, of the exposome to understand that. Gotcha. Makes sense. Um, you mentioned uh, in the middle of your talk that about 80% of patients will remit to a course of steroids. There, there's a nice upfront response. What percent of that 80 go on to be disease-free for the rest of their lives? And, and how many will have something else come back at some point? Yeah, that's, it's very few. Um, you know, once you withdraw steroids, uh, even in individuals who uh, are responsive to steroids, the probability that they will continue to respond to steroids if they were to continue them in our older data when steroids were all we had and we didn't completely understand the risks, uh, over half of them will flare even continuously exposed to steroids. Um, so, you know, the, 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 and, and then those that you successfully taper off, again, you know, um, you're, you're looking at greater than 60, 70 percentile range uh, that will potentially have a flare again within the next year. Um, it does become a challenge for ulcerative colitis. We have the mesalamine category of medications, which I didn't talk about here. Um, they're oral, they're topical anti-inflammatory is very effective for both inducing and maintaining remission and, and really excellent options for patients with mild UC. Um, unfortunately, they don't seem to do the trick in Crohn's disease, and this is borne out in multiple systematic reviews and Cochrane analyses, and we don't recommend their use in Crohn's of any real form uh, at this point. Um, so in our Crohn's patient population, we can try that initial course of steroids, but if you're going to leave them off therapy at that point, then I think there's a, a role for continued monitoring of some sort, either through repeat visits for assessing for recurrence of symptoms or inflammatory marker monitoring, which is really become in vogue right now every sort of three to four months, because there's some data that show that that starts to tick up before patients even become symptomatic. And were that the case, then you would start treating them with a steroid sparing agent when you saw that? Yeah, my rule of thumb for patients when with mild Crohn's disease, who I give, for instance, a course of Endicord is like you get one of these a year. Mm -hmm. 
Got if it. you require a second course of Entacort this year, then we really need to talk about, especially now that we have uh, medications such as vetalizumab, which have a really favorable safety profile in comparison to some of our earlier anti-TNF drugs um, or our oral therapies. Makes good sense. Um, so we have a, a number of questions, but I wanna make sure, I wanna give Dr. Chopra the, the last question here. Um, thoughts for Dr. Scott? Yeah, thanks, uh, Dr. Connors. Dr. Scott, great talk. Um, my question is around the counterfactual regarding the delays to actually starting uh, uh, advanced therapy. So are there, you know, this is sort of an issue in this country, not just with GI therapies, but also I think in other areas, as you alluded to earlier, but are there countries that are doing this right? And do we have data from those countries that suggest that these earlier uh, initiations actually do make differences in outcomes? The closest we've got is, is probably that study that I showed from the pediatric risk cohort of by Super Kogathison, where they demonstrated that their, their cutoff for early anti-TNF use was 90 days. That still doesn't get the window as tight as I think it should be. And we don't, we don't have uh, good retrospective data where individuals, for instance, would the ideal study here, uh, which would never be ethically approved, would be to randomize individuals to a cohort that receives their anti-TNF within, within a week versus waiting the, the traditional 25 days. We don't have that sort of uh, observational data from a cohort of individuals where we know they got started within a week to see if there's a difference. That, but it's a great question. Are there, are there countries that are doing this that perhaps could serve as external references, Denmark, Scandinavia with their large registries where- Yeah, I, Dem Denmark would be a great example. Um, you know, uh, some of, a lot of the UK databases such as CPRD and THIN don't do a great job of tracking infusion-based medications. So they're sort of off the table, but Denmark uh, would be the one that would be the data set that I would shoot for, for sure. And that's a great idea. It might be something worth me sending an email to, to or two to figure out. It's great. Yeah, really appreciate this. Frank, thank you very much for being here. Um, we have more questions we have time for, which is always a sign of a good talk. So appreciate you doing this. And uh, thank you again. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.